for the people of Israel and Palestine since I don't know when. The very land that we are reading about in the book of Joshua this morning, the very towns and cities that are here in our reading are the same towns and the same cities that we have seen on our screens day after day after day so distressingly. Did you notice in the reading we had Gaza? That's Gaza. And we had Ashkelon, Ashkelon from which you'll have heard the BBC reporting. And these are not just names in a Bible story. They are real places lived in by real people, both back then and today. When Joshua had grown old, we read, the Lord said to him, you are now very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. This is the land that remains, Gaza, Ashdod, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron, all the land of the Canaanites. I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance as I have instructed you. So, what does this passage have to say to us in the midst of all this? I love that picture, that picture of the man with his hands on his head. It, it just says it all, doesn't it, really? Well, it says something. But what does it mean to say that God provides a land for his people? Just what is happening in these chapters from 10 to 19 that have been set for us today? Well, to begin to get a sense of what's happening in Joshua and what it means, we need firstly to zoom out, a little bit like David's been doing, to zoom out and to look at the bigger picture, to stand back and to see how this episode fits into the great story of God and his world, to zoom out and to see where these chapters fit in the great sweep of God's mission, of God's rescue uh, for this world that he so loves. So come back with me. Come back to the beginning of the story and get ready for another very rapid ride through those first few of the books of the Bible. You ready? You with me? Come back with me to the beginning, back to Genesis 1 and the good world that God created. Are you there? It is a breathtakingly good world. But all too soon things begin to go wrong. We human beings usurp God's place at the centre of life and, well, it's downhill from there on. By Genesis chapter 4, we have brother killing brother, Cain and Abel, and it all begins to spiral out of control. But God still so loves this world. And he sets out on his great rescue mission to save his world from the chaos that it's heading into. And where does God begin? We've already had that this morning. God begins his rescue mission in Genesis chapter 12 by calling Abraham so that all peoples on earth will be blessed through him. And Abraham becomes the father of a community. And I think there are quite a few people here who are old enough to know the song. You know, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. If I was really brave, I'd sing it to you, wouldn't I? <laughs> Abraham becomes the father of a people. A people formed by God. Why? so that all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. There's a bit of a refrain going on here, isn't there? Abraham and God's people are called from the very beginning to be a channel of God's blessing out into the whole world. But life isn't straightforward for God's people. Famine takes them down to Egypt where these foreigners, these incomers, are perceived by the powers that be to be a threat, and they're enslaved. But God hears their cry and wonderfully rescues them, and we're into the story of the crossing of the Red Sea, you remember, with the Egyptian cavalry in hot pursuit. And 
who is it that leads them out of Egypt? I'm just making sure you're with me here. Who leads the people of Israel out of Egypt? Moses. Moses, yeah, Moses. Moses leads them out of slavery, <coughs> and then through Moses, in the wilderness, God gives his people this amazing gift. It's the gift of the law, the gift of Torah, and it's a great gift because this isn't just a set of rules to be obeyed. This is a whole new way of life. We sometimes talk about people emigrating to sunnier countries like Spain or Australia because they're searching for a better quality of life. But when the Bible talks about a whole new way of life, it's not talking about an improved way of life. It is talking about a radically different way of life, the way that God sees life working it's a new life looked at in a new way, built on a new foundation. It's a new life constructed according to a different blueprint. It's a new way of living with God at the center, not just of their personal and spiritual lives, but at the center of their economic life, at the center of the way they organize their society, at the center of the way they live together. It even involves their political life, lived with God as king on earth as he is in heaven. Which is why the law of the Torah describes a way of life that takes care of the widow and the orphan, uh, a way of life that creates space for the outsider, for the alien, for the refugee. When we look at these passages in the book of Joshua where God provides a land for his people, we're beginning to see <clears throat> that God is providing a land where this community can be a living example of what it means to live in the kingdom of God. A land where this community can be a visible living example of what it means to live out this new way of life. A land where this community can begin to show the world a better way to live. The way of life human beings were created to live. This land that God entrusts to them is intended to be a foothold of God's kingdom here on earth. God's desire is that they will live in this land in such a way that it will give the world a glimpse of the coming kingdom of God so that all peoples on the earth, all peoples on the earth will be blessed. Hallelujah. Dr. Johanna Catanaccio is a Palestinian Israeli evangelical Christian who's academic dean at the Nazareth Evangelical College. And he alerts us to this wider vision when he says, in the light of the teachings of the Bible, the promise of the land has never been a political program, but rather a prelude to complete cosmic salvation. That's the salvation David was talking about a few minutes ago. The salvation of people and the, the, the salvation of God's whole creation. God's new heaven and new earth. It was the initiation of the fulfillment of God's kingdom on earth. Now, Jesus talks a lot about the kingdom of God. It was there in our second reading that Eric read to us. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray for the coming of God's kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Where? On earth, as it is in heaven. Now, of course, as we read the Bible, we discover that they often fall short of what God intended. But it's important to stress that God entrusts this land to them so that it can be a place where they can begin to learn to live by the very different values of the kingdom of God. And of course, this is the land of Jesus. It's on this same land 
that the way to God's good future would be revealed. The inbreaking of God's future full of hope happened here because this is the land where Jesus was born, where Jesus lived and died and was raised to new life, the firstborn of God's new creation, the one who will open the kingdom of heaven to all who will trust in and follow him. Which, he, which leads Johanna Catanaccio to describe this troubled land. A womb is a land of laboring, isn't it? The womb in which a new humanity is born. The place for conceiving a new society in which enmity ends and reconciliation as well as peace dominates. That's the big picture that we need to keep in view. The big picture of God's purpose and God's promise. The big picture of God's hope for a desperate world. So having stepped back and looked at the big picture, we now need to zoom back in. To zoom in and look at just what was happening in these chapters, in these early stages of the story of the people of Israel. And as we see God providing this land for his people, if you've read chapters 10 to 19, and I know some of you have because I've met you here this morning reading them, but if you've read those passages, even if you skimmed them, you see God directing Joshua to distribute the land among the various tribes of Israel. Now, that may not seem all that exciting. And I have to confess, until this week, I had probably skimmed those chapters myself. But I need to warn you that as we see what's going on, well, it certainly engaged the passions of the people involved, and for us too, I need to warn you, it's a bit radical and more than a bit challenging. In early agrarian societies, societies that lived off the land like Israel did, in those early agrarian societies, the redistribution of land was quite common. Some of you may remember from school that in ancient agrarian societies, the idea was that that the land belonged to the whole community. And each family, each household, had a right to cultivate part of it. In this country, it was often a particular set of strips of land, wasn't it? But of course, some parts of the land are more productive than others. And the idea was that they rotated the allocation of the land so that everyone had their chance to farm the more productive land as well as take their turn on the land that was harder to work. That was the idea. But of course, sometimes people farming the better land were reluctant to let it go, and the system often broke down, with some families getting trapped in hardship and in poverty through generations. Does it sound familiar? What's happening here? as God's people are established in the land that God has provided for them, is that God is reclaiming sovereignty over the land. And through Joshua, God is redistributing the resources of land more fairly and more justly in ways that are right in his sight. Over the next few chapters, the land is allocated so that every tribal group within the people of Israel is given space to live and to thrive. God was concerned with the down-to-earth nuts and bolts of how the nation's resources were shared out so that all may have, all may have, the resources that they need. Ultimately, those parcels of land, too, were not just to be used for their own benefit, but as part of God showing the world his larger purpose so that all families of the earth will be blessed. 
And thinking about the nitty-gritty details of how the land was settled is a reminder that faith is not just about what happens inside us. It's not a disembodied spirituality that makes us feel better. As God's people, it's not just our personal lives, our spiritual lives that are to be different. It's also the way that we live together in society. When we're living God's way, then the whole of life, not just my individual spiritual life, is meant to be different, to look different. The radical thing that these chapters point to is God's claim over the whole of our living in every way. I remember someone quipping in one church we, we know about. Uh, they say, uh, it used to be that I'd go home from church feeling guilty about my prayer life, and which of us haven't done that. But in this church, they said, I go home feeling guilty about the sort of washing up liquid I use. And you may feel that's a trivial comment, and in some ways maybe it was. But in a small way, it's a reminder that God's design for living is meant to affect every part of our lives. It's about the way that we use the gifts God has given us. It's about the way we use the money, the resources that God entrusts to us. As God's people, we're called to use those gifts, not primarily to serve our own interests, not just to serve our own family and, and, and people like us, but to bless all peoples of the earth. We're called to be a people through whom all God's world will be blessed. These chapters are a radical challenge to the assumptions we have and to the way we live. And in our competitive materialistic society, that's not easy. And it's not easy today to talk about the allocation of land at a time when the Israelis and Palestinians are at war over the land. Because as one American scholar puts it, the book of Joshua brings us quickly and unavoidably into the turmoil, tribulation, anxiety, and violence of land allocation in ancient Palestine and of the sharing of resources in our world today. Now, we can't sort out all the competing arguments about the land this morning, but we have to come back to reflect on the painful realities of the current violent and volatile situation in Gaza and in Israel. And our hearts go out to families in Israel who suffered and are suffering a depth of heartache and a fear that it's hard for us to imagine. And our hearts also go out to families trapped in Gaza under bombardment with water and even hope running out. There are two stories of suffering here, both of which cry out to God to be heard and to be wept over. And faced with the horrific suffering that we see in Israel, Gaza, the warning of Martin Luther King sounds all too relevant. Hate multiplies hate, he warns us. Violence multiplies violence, and toughness multiplies toughness in a descending spiral of destruction. He calls it the chain reaction of evil. Hate begetting hate, wars producing wars. This chain reaction of evil must be broken, he says or we shall be plunged into the dark abyss of annihilation. But how can the chain reaction of evil be broken? As Christians, we know that it can happen because this land is the very land, this very land that is suffering so much, is the very land in which, on the cross, God takes into himself all the anguish and the agony and the pain, all the hate and the violence, and yes, the evil of this situation and of the whole world. 
and God breaks the chain reaction. And on the cross, God in Jesus says to us, no matter how deep the agony, I am with you. My heart breaks with you. And my love is strong enough to hold you. And as the power of God's love raises Jesus from the dead, hope, living hope, rises with him. So where does that leave us this morning? How do we begin to respond to what's happening in Israel and in Gaza? <clears throat> well, we begin by praying for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Israel and in Palestine. I noticed last week that the hospital that was bombed was originally called the Baptist Hospital. Overnight, it's become the Anglican Hospital. But whatever, we know that this is a hospital which is, is an expression of, of many Christians' desire to serve the people of that land. And did you know that there are 13 Baptist churches in the Palestinian territories, including this one in Gaza, as well as 17 Baptist churches in Israel, and those are just the Baptist churches, there are lots of others too. We begin by praying for the Church of Jesus in those lands, as it seeks to be the church in that impossibly difficult situation as God's people seek to live as the church of Jesus, as pointers to the living hope that is ours in Jesus. We pray for them. And if we want to support them practically, grants have already been made by BMS World Mission and by the Baptist World Alliance, and they will have much greater need in the days to come. We begin by praying for our brothers and sisters as they seek to follow the way of Jesus there. And at the same time, we commit ourselves afresh to being the church of Jesus here, forgiving as we have been forgiven. And what better response is there to all that's so far away that we can do so little about than to do the thing that's in front of us here, that we can do something about. I wonder, who is it that we need to forgive today? Committing ourselves to being the people of God here, living the new life of God's kingdom here. And so we say, Lord, may your kingdom come in Israel, in Gaza, and in our lives, in every part, in every way, that the world may see and know its true God. Lord, bless your world through us, we pray. And to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or even imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.